Luke 23, in verse 26. And Simon is mentioned in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels, although really don't ask me about what that exactly means. But I read that. That makes me sound smart. <laughs> Luke 23, 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold on one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. On him they lay the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Lord, please bless your word today. Help us to be mindful of what was done for us, what was given to us, and what we have now as a result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, we want to talk about uh, God's plan. So God had a mighty plan, and it's funny how his plan always transcends man's plan. It's always different, isn't it? I mean, other than the prophets, I was reading in the, uh, thinking about the Bible here, I can't think of any time that a person said, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Oh, yeah, I knew God was going to do that. Oh, yeah. Anybody here ever have that? Where you know what God's going to do? <laughs> no. And you want, you want to know why he doesn't tell us, in a way, other than through his word? Because we probably wouldn't do it. We probably wouldn't like it. And we'll talk about Simon and his plan and how that's, that's possible. But always consistently transcends man's plan, and then afterwards, what does man do? Oh, wow. I get it. Wow, that was pretty cool. Anybody else ever done that? You thought it was going to go one way, it went another. You weren't really happy about it, and then afterwards you went, oh, <laughs> interesting. That's, that's pretty good. You know, Proverbs 6, 9 says, all we want, but if it's not God, thing, it's probably a good idea to watch a plan that involved the king of, of Simon with her hair, and she... So what does Jesus do with the... Can know, right? We'll have an inkling of what's going to happen. Pretty uncomfortable, wouldn't he? Yet, with all this anxiety, he gets up, and who comes through the garden with a mob of people? Here comes Judas, who's just washed his feet here, and just shortly before that. And, but what does Jesus call him? This is very interesting when you read this. Uh, what, what, he calls him friend. Friend, do what you came here for. And Judas said, okay, the guy that I kiss is going to be the one that, that I, uh, this is going to be the one that we want, right? And so the, all that goes down in there. And then also what's poignant to me is what did Peter do that was really impulsive? Everything goes down in the garden. It's, whoa, whoa, uh oh He cut off his ear. Anybody ever cut their ear before? I did one time. Took a sheet of plywood in shop class back in high school, right in the ear. The corner hit me right in the ear. I'm here to tell you that ears bleed really bad. All right? So you can just see this frozen moment where Peter swings the sword and clips his ear, takes it up, blood going everywhere. And it's like this, uh-oh. But what does our Lord do? Yes. He healed a person who um, seemed to be his enemy. He came there to arrest him, to help the arrest and to facilitate taking him away and everything. And he touches him and heals him. What do you think Malchus is? You think his mind changed a little bit then? You think he was, I mean, he was, if you ever hurt yourself badly, you have this moment of, assessment and apprehension and everything. Whoa, 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 what's going on? Feel the blood just come out of the ear. And Jesus is right in front of you. He touches and heals them. And then you feel blood. And your ear is there. And maybe you even saw it lying on the ground first, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Some of us have been there like, oh, this isn't good. <laughs> you know? But then he touches, he, he's healed. I dare say that changed his life, didn't it? over to the high priest's house where they conduct what we all know is an illegal to people because they feared the people, didn't they? They tried to trick them, but they feared the people. Remember when he asked them, are you the, they asked him, are you the Christ? And he says, I'll tell you if you tell me, is John the Baptist, you know, from heaven or earth? And they were, oh, we can't tell, right? Because <laughs> they feared the people. They feared the people. So they've got them behind closed doors and they go, all right, we got you where we want you. All right, no one's going to know. We're going we're gonna to have this out. All right? And so what do they do? They're questioning him. They bring witnesses. What happened with their witnesses, the Bible tells us? 
Yeah, they're lying. They couldn't get the story straight. All that came down too quick for them to all get their story straight and everything. So they're, they didn't agree with each other. So the whole thing's just not going smoothly for them. So finally, the high priest says to him, you know, are you the Christ? And what, is, what does our Savior say back to him? He says, I am. And you're going to see the Son coming in great glory and power from on high. And when he said, I am, that's the name of God. And that was deliberately, Jesus did that deliberately to provoke them. Because they had to know that he is the Christ and everything. So they blindfolded him. And you read the accounts. They had him behind closed doors. So it was open season. They blindfolded him, mocked him by hitting him and said, all right, who hit, who hit you? You know, you ever been hit, blindside hit? The old saying is, it's not how hard you get hit. It's whether or not you see it coming. And when you've been hit blindside, you have no time to prepare. It makes it a little extra. I had a brother, so there's a lot of blindside hitting going on there. So, uh, <laughs> but it's bad. It's bad. They mocked him. They hit him. Prophesy who, who, who hit you. He didn't say anything back to him, did he? So then... We have the events, and I want to quickly compare a couple people. Really, when you think about it, what was the difference between what Judas did and what Peter did over there outside the judgment seat? Judas, of course, betrayed him, said, for money. You know, that's one difference, I suppose you could say. He did it for money, and he led the mob to, I'll show you where he's going to be at, and he led the mob in there to arrest him, right? And what did Peter do? He denied him three times. And each, each time more vehemently than the other. When in reality, both of them betrayed their Lord, right? I mean, in all, at the bottom line, both of them betrayed their Lord. But yet, what was the dramatic differences in their reaction to their mistake? Mm-hmm. Judas, of course, he says he repented. He repented, he went back, and he threw the money down into the temple, said, I have sinned that I betrayed the innocent blood. So far, so good. But then he went out, and he hung himself. Yet Peter repented also. But what did Peter go on to do? He got right with God. It said he went out and he wept bitterly. Both of these people repented, yet their reaction following repentance is totally different. And Peter uses it for a, a, a motivator to do the work of God and everything. I thought that was very interesting because that, that root, both of them really did the same thing. Granted, Peter's was a little more instinctual, you know, reactionary, and Judas's is planned out, but bottom line, both of them betrayed their Lord. Right? So the trial gets nowhere, they haul him to Pilate. Since they couldn't condemn and execute a prisoner, they were governed by Rome and had to go through Rome. So they take him to Pilate, all right? And Pilate sees him, and his wife had told him, his wife had a conversation with him, and when she found that Jesus was there, what, is, what did Pilate's wife say to him? Don't do it. Don't have anything to do with this just man. I had, I've had a dream. He's innocent. And Pilate was listening to his wife. But yet, this was a tough thing because the chief priests were really, really haranguing him and accusing him of some capital offenses, all right? So Pilate's going, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do what my wife says? So, you know, but also what the law says and everything. And so finally he goes, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll go, I'll send him to Herod. Herod's in town. Hey, is Galilean? Perfect. I'll, I'll pawn him off on Herod. Send him over there and Herod can do, take care of this. So they send him over to Herod, send him across town over there with Herod, and Herod sees him, and as Herod says, I read it this morning, Herod is really glad to see Jesus. Why was he glad? Because he wanted to hear the good news? Uh -uh. This is, yes, this is no, we're going to go no. No, he didn't, because he said he wanted to see some kind of a miracle. Herod was, wanted to see the show. If you read about the Herods, they were, they're bad people. We won't go into deal. They're bad people. And it was all about just the show and, and, and indulgence and hedonism and everything like this. And so he wanted to see, hey, do some miracle for us. What did Jesus say? What did he do? 
Nothing. Nothing. So Herod, kind of tired of it, he put him in a gorgeous, he said he arrayed him, he gave him a, a, a beautiful red robe as the king of the Jews, and he, they mocked him and they sent him back to Pilate, who was not happy when he saw Jesus coming back. So Pilate's going, oh no, this is back with me, this is, this is trouble. Wait, I know what I'll do. Every year we release a prisoner. A notable prisoner is kind of a subject of goodwill to the people. We release him a prisoner. I'll take the worst prisoner in there, Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's an insurrectionist. He's a bad dude. I'll, put the, I'll have the two, uh, two sides, Barabbas, Jesus. It'll be a no-brainer. Of course they'll choose Jesus. <laughs> Barabbas is so bad. So he goes, ah, that, that'll, that'll fix it. So he does this. He brings out and he offers them the choice, and what do they choose? It was kind of like, um, you think about Barabbas in prison, facing probably crucifixion, murder, insurrection. These are bad things. He's facing crucifixion where suddenly he's pulled out and freed. Wow. That's a whole sermon even amongst itself. Would you imagine what Barabbas was thinking there, right? And they choose Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. And Pilate's going, oh, no, this is... Bad, and he's questioning Jesus. He can't find anything wrong with him, and they play this game back and forth. Meanwhile, everything's getting tumultuous out there. They're they're raising a ruckus and everything, and things are getting tough for Pilate. So finally, he says, "All right." He washes his hands. What an image that is! He washes his hands. Says, "I'm innocent of the blood of this just person," because he knew if it was a riot. And Pilate was on thin ice with Rome anyway. If you read the scriptures, what happened uh, a couple of years before then, the Galileans had a revolt, and he went in there and f- fixed their wagons and shed a lot of blood and put down the revolt and everything. But Rome wanted things governed in peace. So he knew that if things got out of hand now with Jesus, he's probably going to lose his job. He's probably going to get recalled. Bad things are going to happen here. So he thinks that he can get off the hook by washing his hands of all this. And when he washed his hands of Jesus, and what did the people say? I'm innocent of the blood of this just man. And what did the people say? What did they reply back to him? They called for him to be crucified, but they also said something that that resonated with me. They said, his blood be on us and on our children. Little did they know that was absolutely true. So he delivers them up to be crucified. You know, crucifixion was a, a very old form of execution and everything. And prior to this, what the Romans would do, they'd scourge them. And you've watched the Passion of the Christ, and anybody here get real uncomfortable during the scourging part of it? Was that tough? You know, I read in an interview one time, Jim Caviezel said that what they did is they put a board on his back, they had a board on his back, so it looked real with the camera angle, and they were hitting it, but they're hitting the board. But he said once the board slipped off and he took a real one, he goes, it, it, it really, really hurt, as you can well imagine. The Romans would do this to half kill the condemned person, so they put him on the cross that, that it would be right. And the Romans, the Romans were remarkable people, but they were not kind. The Roman army was not kind. They ruled really by, by force, and they were very good at deterrence. You know what deterrence is? When you make an example of somebody, you make everyone else go, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. So, so they did that, all right? Fear is a big thing. Yep, yep. The crucifixions all happened in public. The scourgings were, were tough and everything. They had a, they had a whip that, would, that had uh, up to nine tails on it, and at the end of each tail, leather tail, would have a piece of metal or bone. I mean, and it's not comfortable to, talk, uh, to think about these things or talk about these things, but I think this is important because this is what God's plan would happen. And who would have ever thought that mankind was going to be redeemed by way of a, a Roman scourging? Doesn't make sense, does it? Not, not the script that I would come up with, does it? All right? So they scourge him. And again, the scourging was to blood loss, to beat them half to death so that when they got him to the to crucifixion, they wouldn't have to wait around all the time. 
So then they put his own clothes back on him and then led him away to be crucified. And so he's carrying his cross. And I'll tell you the parts of the cross here in a minute. But it's about 350 yards between the scourging place, the, Pilate, the judgment seat where Pilate was, to the gate. They're going to take him out the sheep gate, whereas outside the sheep gate was Golgotha. All right? So our Savior is bearing the, the, the cross beam, the, um, and he's bearing this, and he makes it as far as the sheep gate, which the scriptures all say that he, 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 he went out, and he's bearing his own cross. But at the sheep gate, with 40 yards to go up to Golgotha, he can't make it any further. And he collapses. And this is a problem with the Romans because they had to get this over with. They're on a timeline and everything. They want to get this done with. And they look around. How are we going to do this? Jesus is obviously not in any shape. He can't make it up the hill to Golgotha, even though it's just right there. And they spot Simon. Simon of Cyrene, he's, he's, Cyrene is a place in eastern Libya, is a thousand miles away from Jerusalem. All right? There's a big Jewish community there. Simon had come in for the Passover, a, a, a feast, the, the Jubilee Passover and everything. And so he'd come all this way to, to go to the temple and offer his sacrifices and celebrate as the Jews were ordered to do. He's come a thousand miles to do this. The city is full of people. Everyone's camping around the outside. Simon's going to come in the sheep gate, so he, but then they're going out the sheep gate, so they have to stand back and wait. So he's waiting for them to come through, and here Jesus collapses right in front of him. Simon's got all these plans. You know, a thousand-mile trip in those days was a hop on an airplane. It was a long haul, you know, by way of sea, by land, whatever. He's come all this way, maybe a trip of a lifetime, if you think about it, all the way to Jerusalem to do this. And here he is, standing there and, and watching the spectacle, which has to proceed through before they can go in. And Jesus collapses in front of him. And the soldiers are looking around, trying to figure out what to do, and they see Simon. And right then, all the plans that Simon had about what he planned to do in the trip of a lifetime, and isn't this going to be great and everything, they all go right out the window, don't they? Because every one of the Gospels that talks about Simon in the encounter there, they said they had to compel him. Simon knew if he picks up the cross, the blood on it and everything, he's unclean. There's no going to the temple. There's going to be no offering sacrifices. There's not going to be none of that. All the stuff you came here for is impossible now. Yet, when a Roman soldier tells you to do something, you do it. So Simon picks up the cross and he had to go in and follow Jesus. So Jesus was walking ahead 40 yards uphill to Golgotha. And don't you know that Simon, if you think about how we would feel if this happened to us in those circumstances, what would you feel? You'd be angry. You'd be embarrassed. You'd be humiliated that I've got to be part of this criminal procession. You'd be confused. You'd be a lot of negative things, wouldn't you? Simon picks up the beam and heads up the hill and he's following Christ. And think of his perspective. He's listening to the women wailing. He's listening to the soldiers barking orders. But he also hears Jesus talk to the women that are following him and says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves. Because if they do this when the leaf is green, what will they do when it's dry? And Simon's listening to this. He's seeing our Savior just bad shape. But it's also interesting what Jesus said in uh, Matthew 16, 24. He says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus talks about taking up his cross and following him. And here, Simon is doing exactly that. Not that he probably heard Jesus say that, but I think the, the, the imagery is interesting. He's going up the hill behind Jesus to Golgotha. All right? And he's bearing the cross. The cross is the horizontal member. It's called the, let me, 
help me out here. Patubulium, all right? And usually it weighed 100 pounds. It'd be like a big railroad tie. You had to carry that up there, all right? So Simon's carrying this up here behind Jesus and everything. And they get up to Golgotha, and Simon puts down the beam. You think he left? I don't think he did. I don't think he did for a couple reasons. Number one, he's already unclean. He can't go to the temple. He can't do what he came there for, what he traveled all those miles to do. He's already there. But he's also seen something from a vantage point unique in history. The greatest event in the history of man, he's there in a vantage point right behind Jesus. All right? And what's interesting is that in Mark 15, 21, when they talk about Simon, they talk about him being the father of Alexander and Rufus. All right? And historians believe that Rufus is the same Rufus who Paul uh, uh, says hi to in, in Romans 16, 13, the house of Rufus and his mother. It appears that Simon was converted and led his kids to Christ. But I also think that Simon stayed there. And the parts of the cross, let me finish this. The vertical upright is called the, the stipes, weighed about 200 pounds, all right? I mean, they reuse these things a lot, so it had to be rugged. But what the Romans did... They had different ways of crucifying people and everything, but the Romans, what they did a lot of times, they had a seat called the patubulium, which was a seat kind of under midway up that your buttocks would rest on so you could, you could push up on it. They also had a foot rest on there called the sapandium. Okay, I butchered that. It's a big word. But which your feet would rest on so you could push yourself up because the difficulty is your suffocation. Suffocation is you hung there. So this would allow them to push themselves up, get a breath and everything, so that they could continue the suffering and prolong the show and show people what happens when you mess with Rome. Right? Also thought of something else in terms of what my Savior did for me. Think about, number one, what he said when they nailed his arms to the to the tree. And they, they talked about this too. They said the bones of the hand and the wrist really aren't strong enough to support. So a lot of times they would go through the, through the forearm and there's a nerve in there. All right? But think about how that, what he said when they're doing that. What did he say? You think Simon saw that and went, whoa, that would be an incredible thing, wouldn't it? And I don't want to get too graphic. You think about but when you think about what happened, they put him on that tree and everything. They had to put the tree in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. So Simon's watching this. He's heard the women. He's heard Jesus' words to the women. He's then witnessing the two thieves on either side. All right? And I love the imagery of the thieves because what are the first thief to talk? What did he say? And he's a criminal, and he's getting what he, want, what he, what he asks for. But he says, ah, you know, if you're the Christ, save us. It's all about him. What did the other thief say? Yes. He said, we got what we deserve, but this man's done nothing wrong. How did he know that? hanging there on the cross next to him. He, I think that he saw the same thing that Simon saw because he said, the next words are wonderful, what he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say back to him? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that, isn't that just awesome? And think about the comfort that gave that thief in his waning hours. I mean, this is it, right? The comfort that gave that man in his waning hours. And Simon's watching this. He's watching this. He's watching the eclipse. It's a three-hour eclipse. The, uh, to put it in perspective, the eclipse on April 8th, I think I read it's going to be like four and a half minutes long. This is three hours long. Three hours long. The earthquake when Jesus died, all right? He's listening to Jesus' statements on the cross. He's listening to all this, all right? Then he watches his sudden death. Then he cries out with a loud voice, it's finished. Father, in your hands I commend my spirit. 
and he dies. Highly unusual. Highly, so unusual, what do the Romans come around to do to, to hasten the death? All right, we've seen enough. Um, we're not going to let you push up on the footrest anymore. So they'd come along and break their legs. But when they came to Jesus, what did they see? Yeah, and everyone's very surprised. What did, number one, what did the centurion say? Surely this was the Son of God. He believes, he sees us, this is incredible, all right? Pilate was astounded that he was already dead, all right? Think about um, uh, what happened later after that. Uh, the centurion, what, what Simon undoubtedly heard about the, the veil of the temple, what happened to that? From the top to the bottom. This was a big, giant curtain. It's like a foot thick that was... I forget the height. It was a massive curtain. It was ripped in half. You don't think that got some people's attention? He heard about all this. So I think that Simon... I think that Simon believed. And it's an illustration to us that he came into town excited, ready, just exuberant about, you know, traveling all this distance, how great it's going to be and everything like this, and suddenly his plans were changed and turned upside down, weren't they? Do you think that Simon would have gone if he had known what's going to happen? I'm going with no. Do you think that looking back, do you think Simon was glad it happened the way it happened? I really think so. I really think so. All right? I really think so. And like I said, in, in Mark 15, 21, in Romans, we have the, the, the allusion to Rufus. I believe that Simon was saved. And one of these days, I'm going to find out. <laughs> hey, Simon! <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was wondering about you. <laughs> Where's Rufus? Where's your son Rufus at? I want to meet him too. All right. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. You get the top button right and he'll help you do that. Everything else goes on there. And, and when we do make plans and everything, James has a very important thing for us to do. James 4, 15, he says, people talk about, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do the other thing. What does James say that we ought to do? Pop quiz. If the Lord wills, we will do this and that. And I always kind of like that when somebody says that. It's a sure sign of being a Christian. We say, well, Lord willing, I'm going to go over here, do this or do that, do the other thing. And we all should bear that in mind, you know? There's a Yiddish saying. I can't pronounce it. I saw it in writing. I can't pronounce it because it's Yiddish. I could butcher it, and you probably wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> it's Yiddish. It says, man plans and God laughs. It's kind of true, isn't it? It's kind of true, and a lot of us learn that again and again and again. Man plans and God laughs. But also, I want to leave you with this. I want to uh, do the great hymn, tell, read you the lyrics to the great hymn, Trust and Obey by John Samus. And I saw this, it popped in my head and everything, and I, 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 this, this kind of works with this. So when we trust in the Lord and we obey His word, good things are going to happen. It may not seem like good things at first, but it will be good things. All right? The lyrics are, When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds in our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows, for the joy he bestows, are for them who will trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or walk by his side in the way. 
What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Let's pray. Lord, our Father, our Heavenly Father, we, your children, just ask that you would support us, just give us the strength and the, the courage to follow you in all that we do, to keep you first and foremost in our life, to be thankful each and every day, 24-7, for what you did for us and what your sa our Savior, your Son, so willingly did, that he gave his life in the, in the roughest of ways. He gave it all for us because of your love for us and your compassion that transcends our sins if we believe. We pray your mercy on us. Help us to, to honor you in what we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.